Sex and Character by Otto Weininger Preface This book attempts to throw a new and decisive light upon the relationship between the sexes. It is not intended to list the largest possible number of discrete characteristics or to compile the results of the scientific measurements and experiments carried out so far, but tries to trace all the contrasts between man and woman back to a single principle. Consequently, it differs from all other books of its kind. It does not linger on this or that idyll, but advances to a final goal. It does not pile observation upon observation, but places the intellectual differences between the sexes within a system. It is not about women, but about woman. It takes the most common and superficial things as its starting point, but only in order to interpret all the single concrete experiences. This is no inductive metaphysics, but a gradual progression to ever deeper psychological layers. My investigation is not concerned with specifics, but with principles. It does not despise the laboratory, although it regards the laboratory's resources as limited in comparison with the work of analytical self-observation when dealing with deeper problems. An artist portraying a woman can also convey typical features without demonstrating his legitimacy by presenting figures and serial numbers to a guild of experimental judges. The artist does not spurn experience but on the contrary, regards gaining experience as his duty. However, experience to him is only the starting point for delving into himself, which in art it seems like delving into the world. The psychology used in my account is thoroughly philosophical, although its particular method, which is justified only by its particular topic, is to start out from the most trivial experiences. However, the difference between the philosopher's and the artist's task is only a formal one. What is a symbol for the latter becomes a concept for the former. The relationship between expression and content is the same as that between art and philosophy. The artist has inhaled the world in order to exhale it. For the philosopher, it has been exhaled, and he must inhale it again. However, there is, of necessity, something pretentious about all theory. And thus, the same content that appears like nature in a work of art may appear much harsher and, indeed, offensive when it is put forward within a philosophical system as a condensed generalization, as a thesis that is subject to the principle of sufficient reason and that sets out to provide proofs. Where my account is anti-feminist, which it is almost everywhere, men will also be reluctant to agree readily and wholeheartedly. Their sexual egotism always makes them prefer to see woman as they want her to be and as they want to love her. How could I then be unprepared for the reply women will have to my judgment of their sex? The fact that the investigation finally turns against man, placing the largest and indeed the real share of the blame on him, in a deeper sense than the feminist can imagine, will do the author little good and is least likely to help rehabilitate him in the eyes of the female sex. My analysis arrives at the problem of guilt because it rises from the simplest and most obvious phenomena to those high points which not only offer an insight into the nature of woman and her significance in the world as a whole but which also open up a vista of her relationship with humanity and its highest and ultimate tasks. It is from these points that a stance 
can be taken on the problem of culture and the contribution of femininity to the totality of higher aims. Where the problems of culture and humanity coincide, I will therefore try not only to explain but also to evaluate. Here, indeed, explanation and evaluation coincide of their own accord. My investigation is, so to speak, forced to such a high vantage point without aiming for it from the outset. It gradually recognises the inadequacy of all empirical psychological philosophy on the very grounds of empirical psychology. This does not diminish its respect for experience, which rather than being destroyed is always more appreciated if we recognise in the phenomena, in fact the only things that we can experience, any components which assure us that the phenomena are not the only things that exist. And when we perceive those signs that point to something higher, situated above the phenomena, that there is such a, a primary source can be asserted even if no living human being will ever reach it. And this book will not rest until it has led its reader close to that source. I would not have dared to aspire to such a high goal in the narrow space in which the different opinions about woman and the woman question have clashed so far. However, the problem involves all the most profound mysteries of existence. It can be resolved practically and theoretically, morally or metaphysically, only with the firm guidance of a Weltanschauung a Weltanschauung, that is, one worthy of this name, is not something that could ever prove to be a hindrance to particular discoveries. On the contrary, it is the motive force of every particular discovery that conveys a deeper truth. Weltanschauung is productive in itself and can never be synthetically generated. As every age that subscribes to merely empirical science believes, from a sum of specific knowledge, however large this may be. Only the germs of such a comprehensive outlook become visible in this book. This outlook is most closely related to the views of Kant, Plato and Christianity, although I was to a large extent obliged to create the scientific, psychological and philosophical logical and ethical foundations for myself. There are many things that I have been unable to discuss in detail and that I intend to explain fully in the near future. If I nevertheless draw attention to those parts of the book in particular, it is because I am even more concerned that what it says about the most profound and most general problems is taken to heart than with any applause that its specific application to the woman question might expect. Should the philosophical reader be embarrassed by the fact that the discussion of the most elevated and ultimate question seems, as it were, to be pressed into the service of a specific problem of no great dignity, I would share this unpleasant feeling with him. However, I may say that here the specific problem of the opposition of the sexes is the starting point rather than the goal of a more penetrating study. Thus I have derived great profit from the examination of this problem with regard to the, the cardinal questions of logic concerning judgment and concepts and their relationship with the axioms of thinking, to the theory of the comic, of love, of beauty and of value to issues such as solitude and ethics and the connections between the two and to the phenomenon of genius, the longing for immortality and Judaism. Naturally such broad discussions in the end also benefit the specific problem 
which enters into more and more varied relationships the more the field of investigation increases. And if, in this broader context, the nature of woman proves to offer little hope for culture, if the final results completely devalue, indeed negate, femininity, they are not intended to destroy anything that is, to disparage anything that has a value in itself. I would be somewhat horrified by my own action if I were really only a destroyer and nothing were left standing. Perhaps the affirmative statements in the book have been orchestrated less forcefully, but those who can hear will nevertheless be able to hear them everywhere. The book is divided into two parts, the first, biological and psychological, the second, psychological and philosophical. Some may think that it would have been better if I had divided the whole into two separate books, one purely scientific and the other purely introspective. However, I had to free myself from biology in order to become a psychologist through and through. My treatment of certain psychological problems in the second part is quite different from the approach of a present-day scientist, and I realise that this also puts the reception of the first part by many readers at risk. Nevertheless, the entire first part demands to be noted and judged by science, which the second part, with its greater concentration on internal experience, can demand only in a few places. Because the second part emanates from a non-positivist outlook, many will regard both parts as unscientific, however firmly positivism is refuted in that part. For the time being, I must learn to live with this in the conviction of having given biology its due and vindicated the rights of a non-biological, non-physiological psychology for all times. Perhaps I shall be accused of not supplying enough proofs at certain points. However, this seems to me to be the smallest weakness of my investigation. What could prove mean in this context? What is discussed here is neither mathematics nor epistemology, the latter only in two places, but matters of empirical science, where the most one can do is to put a finger on what is. In these areas, what is normally called proof is merely an agreement between the new experiences and the old. And it does not matter whether new phenomena are experimentally produced by a human being or given in a finished state by the creative hand of nature. Of the latter kind of proof, this book supplies plenty. Finally, as far as I can judge, the main part of the book is not one that can be understood and absorbed after a single superficial reading. I wish to state this for the information of the reader and for my own protection. The less I repeated old and well-known things in both parts, particularly in the second, the more I wanted to point out all concurrences when I found myself in agreement with what had been said before and what was generally recognised and that is the purpose of the references in the appendix. I tried to reproduce the quotations accurately and in such a form as would be of use to both lay readers and experts, because of their exhaustiveness and in order to prevent the reader stumbling at every step, these references have been relegated to the end of the book. My thanks are due to Professor Lawrence Mühlner for his effective support and to Professor Friedrich Jull for the kind interest he has taken in my work from the outset. I, spill, I feel especially indebted to the friends who assisted me in correcting the book. <laughs>